Welcome to The Lover's Hole. You're with Mike and Ian. And we're reading through the Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matra novels of Patrick O'Brien. Uh, Ian, we have one of our favorite things this week. We get to pull a new book down off the shelf. Can you tell us where we ended up last week and what we have in store? Last week, Mike, we wrapped up The Surgeon's Mate. So, Jack Aubrey, Stephen Maturin, and Yagiello, their new comrade, have escaped from France with Diana and with the help of allies, friends, who knows what, a Talleyrand and Duhamel on the French side. They met an old friend, Captain Babington, on their way back across the Channel. Babington married Stephen and Diana aboard ship once they had stopped going after each other, hammer and tongs, aboard the cartel before they reached England. So... It seemed like the big O'Brien happy ending, right? And uh, we shared the moment of the happy ending with our guest, Rachel McMillan. And we had this lovely conversation looking back at the evolution of Diana's character and what a great female literary character she is and how rich and complex her role has been in the story. And that also allowed us to look forward. I think on a large scale, Mike, we're looking forward to what happens next with Stephen and Diana and their characters. One wonders what's going to be their situation now. And I think we're also wondering what's up with Jack and Sophie, because Jack's been abroad a lot and behaving pretty poorly as husbands go. He has these legal problems still hanging over his head. He has no ship. He's kind of promised a new ship on the stocks, but we believe that that's not yet a completely foregone conclusion. This book, The Ionian Mission, suggests that there's going to be an adventure somewhere in the eastern Mediterranean. How are we going to get there? Where's the adventure going to take us? And spoiler alert, I think there's going to be a surprise return of a character later on in the book. I am really looking forward to that. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. So chapter one, O'Brien has you know these fabulous ways of looking ahead, looking back, and he starts comparing the state of Stephen and Jack's lives and marriages. So the opening words of the of chapter one, marriage was once represented as a field of battle rather than a bed of roses. And perhaps there's some who may still support this view. But just as Dr. Matron had made a far more unsuitable match than most, so he set about dealing with the situation in a far more compendious, peaceable, and efficacious way than the great majority of husbands. So we get this really nice intro to Stephen and his approach to marriage. And and I think I I was scratching my head going, wonder how this is going to go. And I'm going to jump ahead 24 pages later because O'Brien picks this metaphor back up again. And we'll come back to this later, but just to compare and contrast the two. So then that's Stephen in a nutshell. How about Jack? As far as real battlefields and beds of roses were concerned, Captain Aubrey was far better acquainted with the first, that is with battlefields, partly because of his profession, Mm. which with enormous intervals of delay, often cold and always wet, brought him into violent conflict with the king's enemies to say nothing of the admiralty, the navy board, and bloody-minded superiors and subordinates, and partly because he was a wretched gardener. (laughs) Wow. Oh, my. Yeah. And it's O'Brien's long game. He's got this great way of you know looking backwards and looking forwards. And um, we've got this big picture contrast between Stephen's life uh, and the metaphors clearly pointing us towards how yeah his life and his marriage are linked. And on the other hand, Jack's life, where his life as Sophie's husband is really quite disconnected from his life professionally, his life as a naval officer, mm. despite the fact that Miss Smith is now no longer on the scene, and despite the fact that the the apparent pregnancy of Miss Smith in Halifax seems not to be an issue anymore. And he's not being blackmailed by Miss Smith. We still got this really big evaluation being done, I think by um, O'Brien, the author evaluating Jack and his view of marriage and evaluating Stephen and his new evolving picture of marriage. And just to remind ourselves, that was the whole payoff of the last book, right? The surgeon's mate was really about the mating of the surgeon, the mating right. of the surgeon to his yeah, to his longtime love interest to Diana. Oh. And I think that lots of us had, had been worried about Stephen and Diana and their marriage and how it would all work out, given the relationship history, given how long and rocky their engagement was. 
And right from the beginning, we learn that it's not completely a bed of roses, but still somehow really hopeful and really happy. O'Brien says Stephen was an impossible husband, that he'll out your smoke in bed. He plays his cello at all hours of the day and night. He dissects things and leaves them lying around, like in the drawing room. He's not very clean and hygienic. But Stephen recognizes the difference and realizes that Diana is just as stubborn as he is. And he decides to change their living arrangements. It's fascinating. I mean, what a great solution. He he moves himself into his rooms at the Grapes. He leaves Diana in their handsome modern house in Half Moon Street, which is in walking distance of the Grapes. Um, O'Brien yeah. describes their uh, relationship and their interactions with each other. They eat breakfast daily together. They each attend to their own interests during the day. And then Stephen appears at her frequent dinner parties, playing the host to admiration. Um, and so we had you know, a view that this seems to be working for Stephen. And O'Brien tells us uh, that Diana, she was always delighted to see her husband and he to see her. They never quarreled now that all reasons for disagreement were gone. And in fact, this was probably the best possible arrangement for a pair with nothing in common but love and friendship and a series of strange, surprising, shared adventures. I thought to myself, that's not a half bad life, if you ask me. (laughs) No, and I think it's something that we would have wanted for Stephen at any point. If somebody had said to Stephen, by just flat out romantically asking her to marry you, you could get this. I think he should have taken it. Amen. At any time in the previous, what is it now? Six, seven books. Right. I like that we see Diana through Mrs. Broad's eyes. And Mrs. Broad thoroughly approves of Diana, thoroughly approves of the fact that she visits the grapes, thoroughly approves the fact that she brings messages and kindnesses like fresh clothing, is okay with the fact that Diana's spending is a little bit out of control. So she sometimes comes to ask for money. But I think this is all just a nice happy scene it's a nice accommodation that they've all reached it, it really is i mean you know diana's pretty thoroughly rehabilitated here and uh, you know we're all invited to approve of her and of stephen as much as mrs broad does yeah. <laughs> you know and I, I i another big reach back and thank you to rachel mcmillan for helping shed the scales from our eyes at least my eyes in last week's interview here yeah. and it's it's interesting. It's Jack's kind of in the background. We're hearing about Diana and Stephen. And then our first real mentions of Jack come through Stephen and Diana's discussion here. Yeah, that's right. It's even noticeable that Jack gets described as Stephen's particular friend. And usually in the opening pages of a novel, it's the other way about. Right, right. <laughs> but Diana gets to sit with Stephen and talk about going to sea with Jack. Um, they talk about the the ship that's coming, the Worcester, this 74-gun ship of the line. It's described as one of the 40 thieves, which were a set of uh, ships of the line built in a state of corruption and doubtful building practices. They're moldy and badly designed and badly put together and shabbily conceived of. So it's not a plum, not a plum by any means, certainly not the dashing new well-found frigate that I think Jack was hoping to have on the North American station. Um, It's not even a plum billet from the military point of view. They're going to be joining the blockade of the fleet in Toulon. Now, I think from Stephen's point of view and from the domestic point of view, that's okay because they're going to be close to land. They'll be well supplied. But all of the pictures that we've had previously in O'Brien's books of blockade duty have been that it's a bit of a grind and it's a, you know, being a cog in an important machine, but still just a cog. Anyhow, Diana and Mrs. Broad are trying to get Stephen and Jack ready, Stephen in particular. And there's this really funny moment, Mike, of uh, Steve, Stephen going looking for his neck cloth. Right. <laughs> we get his character painted here, I think, in the way he's setting about looking for the neck cloth. Stephen has this surgical retractor, and he's digging all through this sea chest trying to find his neck cloth and, you know, moving stuff around. And he's had this really bad habit of, you know, he'll pull something out and then randomly throw stuff in. There's no organization to it. And Diana and Mrs. Broad are constantly trying to reorganize this, make sure everything's there. And as Stephen has now turned the whole thing upside down, trying to find this, Mrs. Broad walks in with the neck cloth that he's searching for. <laughs> She's had it ironed and starched at Diana's request. And then I love she she looks at Stephen and says, you'd not like to have your frill all limp. 
<laughs> to myself, ah, there's a little O'Brien. Yeah, you don't want a limp frill, do you? And <laughs> Steve just said, of course uh, no. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> right, right. Nudge, nudge. You'll be married, man. You can't be having a limp frill. <laughs> right. So, and, and you know, this is broad. It's kind of reading the list off from Diana, you, you know, to wear this. I've got it arranged for you. She's got new pumps for you to wear. Oh, I can't walk to, you know, the house of new pumps. That's right. That's why she's arranged, you know, a litter to come carry you there, a chair, so you don't mess up your new shoes. So, They've got him pretty well sorted out here, as, as much as you can ever sort out Stephen. He's being handled. And despite being handled, Stephen arrives late at Diana's, oh, of course. Uh, Diana takes him upstairs. And I was happy, of course, to see that Yag Yellow is still part of the, the cast of characters here. She wants to show Stephen a gift. So she's leaving Yag Yellow to take care of the gift. I, I love this little low-key Jack Aubreyism that creeps in, but importantly not in Jack's mouth, uh, she says, we'll leave Yagielo to receive any early worms. <laughs> and Diana gives this gift. And, um, and Mike, I was taken back to the point of the conclusion of The Surgeon's Mate, where Diana makes a gift of this ridiculously valuable diamond as a ransom for Stephen to get him out of uh, captivity in France. Right. And she's still in giving mode. This is, you know, Diana's rehabilitation continues. Bless her. It's wildly inappropriate, this gold-mounted dressing case that for which there's not going to be room, not even in an admiral's cabin, never mind in a surgeon's cabin. But it's a it's a canteen and a backgammon board and a writing desk and a wash hand stand and looking glasses and candle holders appearing. <laughs> this is the <laughs> this is the furniture item of the world, as I think Stephen would say. It is, and and I and I love how Stephen handles this. I mean, he could. Uh... You know, he could just be his regular practical self, but he's obviously learning. So he 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 looks at her, he says, Akushla. Uh, and he draws her close. This is regal splendor. This is imperial magnificence. The physician of the fleet has nothing finer. I'm so grateful, my dear. And grateful, infinitely touched he was. And then Diana, like, shows him how everything works, pulls out everything, uh, goes, the whole thing. And she tells him how she's, you know, she had to just lord it over the workmen all the time, bully them into finishing times. Oh, sweet persuasions, promises till she was hoarse as a crow. And uh, Stephen reflects on her generosity. And Stephen thinks to himself, as rich as even Diana is, this is kind of over and above. She doesn't even have the money for this. And he thinks about the fact that she's pretty ignorant of naval life, as you say, that he's got this damp, cramped cupboard that he lives in there. And that, you know, she probably has more in mind a field soldier like her father, you know, who would have a baggage yeah. wagon and all these orderlies. But for a sailor, you know, they would have to wrap it in wax canvas and stick it down in the hold. So I, I, I love this. You know, I think we have this akushla, which I haven't seen in a long time or heard in a long time, this, this Irish phrase that is just so endearing. But Ian, you reminded me that we know this phrase well. Yeah, we do. So akushla is an Irish word that's taken to mean darling. It's used as an endearment. It actually means my pulse or the pulse of my heart. Right. And it was used as the name given by Clint Eastwood's character to Hilary Swank's character in the Oscar-winning movie Million Dollar Baby. And it's a very, very touching connection to the way one person refers to, to another as Mokushla. So let's just play a little bit of the audio. Mokushla means my darling, my blood. Oh, now, Mike, I, I think that if you know anything about the way Million Dollar Baby ends up and the general tone of the film, it's a bit dark and a, and a bit philosophical compared to the tone that we've currently got of this novel. But I think it's in keeping with the way O'Brien reflects on relationships and the way he's reflected on Stephen and Diana's relationship, certainly in the past. But it's, you know, anything that O'Brien attaches a, an Irish label or an Irish language tag to, I think, is a sign that this is an emotional token that he wants to use with sincerity. Yes. And, you know, uh, Akushla McCree, the pulse of my heart. It's a very poetically, sentimentally, nicely sentimental Irish thing to say. It's, it's why Patrick is an O'Brien. He holds these things dear. <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. But that's not the end of the gift giving. 
No, Diana's got all kinds of gifts for him. And she's so upset. She says, you know, she's trying to get Stephen to forgive her that the woman that she has making Stephen's clothing has only finished a dozen shirts so far. And Stephen's just kind of laughing. He's like, dear, I've never owned that many shirts in my life. And I'll only need two for this short voyage. I'm, I'm only going to visit Barcelona and I'm riding along with Jack and I'll be back before you know it here. Now, he doesn't. He's still a secret agent at heart. He doesn't tell her that he's also meeting with French royalists near Toulon, people who are sick of Napoleon and, and you know, would like to be helpful to England. And he's got some ulterior missions on this mission but as as he's looking at her and she's looking at him she glances out the window and sees that Anne trevor is arriving and she remembers that she hasn't told stephen that uh, this particular woman is coming she hopes he doesn't mind being invited that the woman was kind of insistent because she wants to come see young yellow so young yellow's effect on the ladies has not diminished i mean you know earlier we had had this description of Yagello being there at Diana's home there that is being you know, almost domesticated at Half Moon Street, an absurdly beautiful man, an exceedingly wealthy Lithuanian now attached to the Swedish embassy. So he's, you know, we understand why, why he's in London and why he's there, but that, you know, this woman wants to come and, and you know, I, I love this, you know, Stephen's reply, you know, do you mind if she comes to see young yellow? <laughs> yeah. And Stephen says, ah, oh, never in life, my dear. I'm all for the satisfaction of natural desires, even in Miss Trevor. And he goes on to categorize Miss Trevor for us. Even in Miss Trevor, even in a Judas head, rack renting County Kerry absentee landowner with a Scottish Anabaptist vulture by way of an agent or bailiff. Indeed, we might go so far as to leave them alone for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now we understand why Diana might have been concerned about inviting this young lady. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. We've got all these signifiers of Stephen being in high status and good spirits. Um, he's with his wife. He's giving and receiving gifts. He's enjoying the company of people like Yag Yellow, and he's indulging himself in these big stacks of pointed epithets and aphorisms aimed at other people. It's striking, though, Mike, that while Stephen's star is in the ascendant, I, I think Jack's star is still pretty low on the horizon. You know, as we said, he's going to be on blockade duty, which isn't great for naval distinction. He's got a moldy old ship of the line rather than a flash frigate. Um, people are stealing his lines a little bit here. Lots of the lots of the key moments are actually not um, happening for Jack in this opening um, few pages. So not not exactly auspicious. No, for no. Jack. You know, Diana is, is is really to the point where Diana's suspicious of the whole journey. And she's yeah. telling Stephen, you know, Jack should never have put up with being shoved into this temporary command of the rotten old Worcester. It's almost yeah. like, hearkening back to the leopard here, this terrible yeah. old rotten old. She points out he was supposed to have the Blackwater, one of these new heavy frigates on the North American station as soon as she was ready. And he had actually been working to help get her prepared. Now, all of a sudden, he's on this old 40 thieves ship that, you know, may not even be seaworthy. And, you know, she goes on to say that she thinks that Jack should have been knighted sometime back, given all his record. He should have been given a decent ship, probably even a squadron. And she says, you know, she's not alone. Sophie, Admiral Berkeley, Hennage Dundas, and all of Jack's service friends are perfectly furious about Jack being shoved into this command. Yeah. And remembering as well that this is in the opening chapter of a Patrick O'Brien book. So he's cunningly weaving in a bit of catch up for people who might be joining the canon mid flow. We Stephen delivers this little piece of, of exposition for, for Diana. He says, reminding her that Jack's got these legal troubles with this inventor speculator guy called Kimber. He's facing financial ruin. There's a secondhand story about lawyers getting thrown out of windows, breaking the king's peace. Um, and meanwhile, Jack's lawyers have advised him to get out of the country. And Diana really hopes, just like Sophie, that Jack can get these things behind him and come back when the black water's ready. Stephen does commit a little indiscretion here. He's normally a very close file. He tells her that Jack's had a very hard time even getting the Worcester, despite the promises that were made by the old, the former, the late First Lord of the Admiralty. There was pressure from others, and Jack only got this 
moldy old command because a friend stepped aside. Right. So there's some kind of personal grudge, maybe in the uniform side of the Admiralty, maybe not, we can speculate, that leaves Jack potentially on shore, eating his heart out, says O'Brien, eating his heart out for so much as a rowing boat that flies the king's flag. Yeah, um, that he's, you know, he may have nothing after this. And Diana assumes that it's Jack's father. Nice bit of further exposition. Thank you, Diana. Mm-hmm. Jack's father, retired General Aubrey, who is a bit of a uh, a bit of a liability in Parliament. And Stephen says, yes, it's partly that. It's also this fellow, Andrew Ray, who's now a senior civil servant in the Admiralty. Jack had accused Ray of cheating at cards, what, three books ago now. Right. And rather than calling Jack out for a duel, Ray's getting back at Aubrey, while he, Ray, is acting second secretary. We get this nice little reminder as well of Stephen being relatively unnautical and being invited to explain to Diana what a barge pole is. Diana's willing to respect Stephen's nautical knowledge, and he just about manages to conjure up the idea that, well, it belongs to a barge, and a pole meaning, well, it's a pole. So, well done, Stephen. It's a a, a a mask on the gig from for for the uh, yeah. right no no that's not it Stephen here but it's interesting too as Stephen's relating all this even Di- Diana knows Ray from you know society and some of Ray's behavior and she thinks he's a scrub too so we've got this yeah. guy and he's got this vendetta against Jack and he is acting second secretary to the Admiralty so this is not good news here I don't know whether the following scene is good news or bad news. It's kind of the same news. But guests kind of arrive. There are all these women falling all over Yagello and then behind his back scorning one another. Ian, you, you had posted a, a piece of, of kind of fan art uh, Tal did with a scene of Yagello and these women fighting behind him. And so we've got this scene with Yagello and the women We've got Stephen in here being the consummate host with his bride. The butler happens to open a door. Their family cat runs in and climbs up Stephen and sits on his shoulder and is rubbing against his wig. And I loved the the thought of of seeing that. And it says that there's a fabulous dinner with all these guests, with all of Stephen's favorite dishes. You know, Diana has been so thoughtful about this. It's kind of his farewell party. And that Diana has got like one of the best cooks in London. Said there, there was one ugly scene they mentioned where the butler has to remove the cat from Stephen's shoulder. <laughs> and, uh, but other than that, it's all going well. When Stephen realizes that he's been carefully looking kind of across his guests at a clock on the, on the sidewall and then realizes, oh my gosh, that clock is stopped. It's not running. So I'm trying to make sure I'm on time because my gosh, I do not want to be late catching the Portsmouth coach. Um, But now I have no idea what time it is. And he knows socially he can't look at his watch. That would be an absolute insult to his guest and his bride. Um, And I I love how O'Brien writes this, that Diana is seated at the complete opposite ends of the table just kind of somehow knows what's on his mind and knows that he's a little worried. And she says, don't worry. Yag Yellow has got the, you know, the uh, Swedish ambassador's coach. He's borrowed it. And he is going to drive us to Portsmouth so we can go together, um, which is really kind of nice. I just love this. Um, so Stephen's thrilled. Yeah. Now, Diane had asked if she could drive the coach. And Yagello had said, no, 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 you know, not, certainly not until sunrise. And then only with Stephen's permission. And S- Stephen's a little stunned. He thinks, you know, I can't believe Diana accepted those conditions. And he assures Yagello that Diana drives prodigiously well. And then Yagello gets really excited because he really admires a woman who can ride, who can drive, who understands horses. Me too. It's one of the reasons I married a horse whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> then Yagello goes on in front of the whole guest there to list all of Mrs. Matron's shining parts, which he thought had only been lacking a thorough understanding of horses to be quite complete. And now she has that. She's perfect, which, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get this impression that Yagiello is pretty taken with Diana. And the connection with horses is important to Yagiello professionally. He's a hussar. He's a light cavalry officer. So right. I think he sets quite a lot of store by other people's appreciation of, of horsemanship. Now, 
we get this momentary glance at the scene through another person's perspective. We get Nathan, who's Diana's business manager, lawyer, I guess, looking at Yagyello with an it says an amused, benign, cynical face, looking at how youthful and cheerful and enthusiastic and maybe simple Yagyello is. And we get this reflection on whether or not Yagyello is conscious of how other people see him and how fortunate he is to have this charm and these good looks. And we get this little Latin tag, Fortunatus Nimium. Fortunatus Nimium. Where does that take us, Mike? I'm always so impressed by the way O'Brien can reach back and pull this back. This is actually Virgil in, in the Georgics. It's kind of on the surface. It's this reference to farmers. Oh, happy, happy husband, man. Yeah. Did they but know the blessings they possess for whom far from the din of war, the kindly earth pours forth any easy sustenance. So that's the full verse there. And this has often been, you know, used to think about the kind of the idyllic life in the countryside. It was actually part of the funeral oration for George Washington here. And, and this reference to the din of war kind of appropriate as Stephen heads that way. But I was researching this a little bit and there's a professor Ibronx who gives us a little West Wing alert here in the midst of Virgil. <laughs> yeah, he seems to want to dismiss the idea that this is just a sort of harmless bucolic quote about farmers and how dull they are. He says, this poem is all about Augustan politics. He says, it's like the West Wing, but in a poem. So the quote actually means, oh, how happy those farmers would be if only they knew how lucky they are. And maybe he's speculating that right now the farmers are probably complaining about their sheep being too white or something, but wishing that they'd gone to pirate school. But Virgil says, it's better to be a farmer than to have your ship mashed to splinters by a huge Roman navy. So, wow, we get the connection to high politics. Uh, We get the connection to doom at the hands of a foreign navy. How deep is O'Brien going with this foreshadowing and with all of these things? (laughs) Right. Well, Diane has got this thing really well planned, really well managed. She's got all the guests sort of being headed out. Their coaches are coming up to get them. And she's left plenty of time to get Stephen to the Portsmouth coach. I think I said Plymouth before. It's They're headed for Portsmouth and then on to Plymouth later. But so she's got now, uh, you know, at least a half hour to spare. And rather than getting rolling, her man of business, Nathan, has said that he'd really love to speak to Diana a little bit. And what he has in mind is selling some of her jewels because with some of Napoleon's recent victories over the Austrians and the Prussians, the price of her jewelry has gone way up. Nathan still thinks that Napoleon will ultimately be doomed, and he wants her to switch from these jewels to some very depressed British stocks, which will yield tremendous returns once the Allies win the war. Um, Diana says, well, you know, let's talk about that. But, you know, Diana, always social and everything, says, let's just head to the billiards room for dessert. You and I can talk. All of us, <laughs> the four of us can play a game here. And um, and Nathan, and, and she says, by the way, that uh, Stephen has to say goodbye to his olive tree. Apparently, Stephen, in the billiards room, has an actual olive tree that he's trying to grow in the midst of the room here. So, so Stephen, and so Diana to allow him. The four of them are playing billiards. Three of them are extremely intense competitors. Stephen, every once in a while, gets drug over to kind of poke at a ball while he goes back to his olive tree. And Nathan's reflecting, too, on how... With every other client he has, even though the wife has the wealth, the husband manages it. But Stephen will have nothing to do with that. He says, it's Diana's fortune. Diana should manage that. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. You talk to Diana. And Stephen's kind of really a little bit remote as the three of them are really intense in the billiards play. And we get right down to Diana where... um, you know, she's she's a little bit behind, but with just the right shot, she could win this thing, a very aggressive shot. And she's stretching way out across the table. And all of a sudden, Stephen, boom, is right back on this game because he's concerned yeah. that she might be with child and doesn't want her in that posture doing it. And Ian, you might take us from here. What happens? I love this. <laughs> so Diana sets up this really 
uh, aggressive, poised gymnastic trick billiard shot. I, I love the little detail that O'Brien gives her as of her tongue peeking out from between her lips as she concentrates. And it then she sinks the shot and it says, she slips off the table with such a live, easy grace and such an open, delighted triumph that Stephen's heart stopped for a beat and the other men looked at her with the utmost fondness. And at that moment, Yagiello's coach arrives. So right. again, little little juxtaposition there between the poison, grace and appeal of Diana and Yagiello. Stick a pin in that. Right. And it, I, I love the imagery. Uh, I don't know, it conjures this picture of Diana poised and balanced and vital playing a billiard shot. For some reason, it really sticks with me. So I think it's great stuff. Me too. But Mike, we, we've spent we've spent a long time in company with Stephen and Diana. Patrick O'Brien has shown us the world that they're in and shown us the world through their eyes. It's been a while since we heard anything in detail about Jack Aubrey. So maybe we should take a quick break and come back to hear more about where Jack is at in the world. Fill your glasses, go admire your olive trees, or take that last billiard shot, and we'll be right back with you. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. You're listening to The Lover's Hole, and you're with Ian and Mike as we turn the pages of the first chapter of The Ionian Mission. So, Mike, we've been thinking a lot about Stephen, and I just want to call out the fact that I like the fact we do finally get to turn our attention to Jack. We had this message that you pointed out earlier on, this uh, this analogizing of marriage and the field of battle, and that Jack was a lot more familiar with the with the field of battle side of things than he is with the marriage side of things. It says, for all his loving care, the roses at Ashgrove Cottage produced more green fly, caterpillars, mildew, rust, and grey mould than flowers. Never enough at any one time to make a bed for a dwarf let alone a six-foot sea officer who tips the beam at 16 stone. So, Mike, there's two things going on here. First of all, we're extending the metaphor of you know, bed of roses, and we're going all the way back, I think, to the Mauritius command, to the idea that Ashgrove Cottage and roses and horticulture aren't exactly successful. Right. <laughs> and that Jack and Sophie between them aren't being very successful, you know, growing beautiful and plentiful things. But it's a bit cruel to keep sniping on at Jack about his weight. Right. So I've, I've always had this thing in where, you know, we, we always hear about Jack being obese, Jack being so big, Jack being out of shape. And, you know, and then we got Russell Crowe in Master and Commander. Yeah. And so I had to look this up. 16 stone, those for, for you, those of you on my side of the Atlantic, that's 224 pounds. So I, and he's always described Jack as a tall man. So I thought, well, you know, this doesn't seem too terribly bad, but he does seem to love to poke at him about it. He does. And I suspect that that's a little way of pricking the hubris and the ego of Jack when we need to. I think it's also a little way of reminding us that even a, a fair-haired hero figure has to have some, some, some vulnerability, some physical vulnerability. We're going to come back to Jack and his weight a little bit later on once they get to see, I think. Ah. But where do we pick Jack's story up? We don't get to see Jack at home. We don't get to see Jack amidst the bucolic charms of London or even of Ashgrove. We pick the story of Jack back on the deck of HMS Worcester. Jack's not happy. He's a single anchor in Portsmouth waiting. He's been waiting there ready to sail for more than an entire watch. We get this picture in the eyes of others of Jack Aubrey looking stern in a state of angry tension. Officers snappish, dinner delayed. And of course, what they're waiting for is the arrival of Stephen in the coach being driven by Diana. Jack is feeling really, really angry about this. The anger is pointed up to us, I think, because it's not just a personal affront to Jack, which I think he could cope with pretty well. And it's not just that Stephen is a little bit of a lubber and a little bit not very nautical. I think the problem is that Jack is being made to look like a bit of a buffoon in front of people whose esteem he cherishes, namely the service and particularly the port admiral. Um, Jack had requested and the admiral had granted a long delay, but 
now the ship's proceed to sea signal is flying and he knows that they're going to have to leave Stephen behind. And all of the last, last preparations are made, raising the anchor, getting the rigging ready to sail away, readying Sophie and the children to go over the side. And this is a big contrast, Mike. You know, Stephen and Diana in happy gift-giving domestic bliss <laughs> in London versus Jack bidding a hasty farewell to Sophie and the children over the side. We've had this fleeting glimpse of Sophie and the three children, but now duty is calling, and the only thing stopping Jack from fulfilling that is the arrival of Stephen. So, just slowly enough, they manage to win the anchor and begin to set sail. The coach arrives, takes a corner at breakneck speed. Jack recognizes Diana and Stephen and notes the usual hellfire drama. We do get an idea of some sympathy because in Jack's mind, we see he says, poor Stephen steps out with a parcel. And Jack is able to reflect that he's glad that Stephen has someone to look after him, even if it is only Diana. And the only, I think, is quite pointed as well. <sighs> so Jack gets to say his farewells. He tells Pullings to take his time, make the crew look like they're hurrying up slowly. Goodbye, my dearest, says Sophie, smiling as well as she could, the great tears welling. God bless you and keep you. God bless you too, says Jack and orders a whip to get the children roped over the side and asks the midshipman to have his gig spread every stitch of canvas they possess. Sophie and the children are well on the way when the gig catches up with the ship in a choppy sea. Yeah, they, you know, Jack's angry. He's pretty cold. And he sees Stephen looking meek, kind of very in the back of the of the gig, holding his parcel in his lap here. And Jack goes below deck. He's not even to be on deck when Stephen comes up. So we're kind of like, wow. And Pullings asks a midshipman to bring him a half pint of sweet oil. <laughs> kind of seen that. I was a little like, what? But so Stephen has to get up from the gig onto the ship. They're both moving. It's this choppy sea. And apparently Worcester is not really an easy one to get up on. And they have not, uh, they've not rigged a bosun's chair. They haven't made this easy. And Stephen sees all this thing. He is looking at this sheer height that he has to get up. First, he has to leap from the gig over to the ship, which he does. He's looking at this height. There are a couple of man ropes. And he's also thinking to himself about, you know, he's really behaved badly. He knows he's in disgrace. I mean, he's thinking back that when Bonden, who had been ashore apparently all afternoon looking for Stephen, all day looking for Stephen, had greeted him. Bonden had no smile. Bonded admonished him, as you said, Ian, for making the captain look like a ninny yeah. in the face of the whole fleet. And Stephen, you know, is like, oh my gosh, how do I make this up? Bonded helps him up the man rope finally a little bit. And Stephen thinks, all right, I've got to make sure that I do the right thing as I get on board. You know, I've got to turn and salute the quarter deck. But he forgets that because of this <laughs> fast ride in the coach he had and, and the gig, he clipped his hat to his wig. So when he goes to take off his hat, bow to the quarter deck, he takes off his wig and he's waving them both together, which everybody laughs at. And then he's even more mortified. Moet, you know, Moet, who loves Stephen, as I admonishes him. And uh, Poolings, looking stiff and remote, O'Brien says, reminds him that they were supposed to sail two tides ago and provides, in O'Brien's word, no kind word of greeting. Stephen mm. is soaked. He's cold. He's cowling under everyone's sort of moral superiority. He remembers that the sailors, you know, have this thing about teasing the guys who are a little bit more of a level like Stephen. But he's not sure, and he just doesn't say a word. And I think he's so cowed that pulling softens just a little bit. He sees how soaked Stephen is as he was hanging on the side of the ship. The waves were just washing over him while he's trying to figure out how to get up the side, right? And he asked Stephen, did, did the sea get your watch, this beautiful watch that Stephen had taken off this French agent? Stephen realizes a bit panic that, in fact, it has been soaked. Pulling takes it and dips it into the sweet oil that he's arranged for just that purpose. So I was like, oh, thank goodness. At least Tom had this forethought, this really touching gesture. You know, it's more what I expect of Poolings. Everybody's been, you know, everybody who loves Stephen is so stern here. Ah, I'm kind of thinking, where is this going here? Where is this going? We've seen kind of everybody but Jack greet Stephen. What's going to happen? And eventually we get a little bit of softening. 
Jack on deck had dressed Stephen down for lateness. Having started the lecture, Jack halts and he holds out a hand, shakes Stephen's hand and says, damn my eyes. I was like a cat on hot tiles all through this vile morning and afternoon. I spoke a little hasty. Huh. So there's at least, we're holding out the possibility here that things can get back to normality and Stephen's not completely in disgrace and that Jack is also a little bit human, which is nice to see. Um, they, between them, look ashore to see their families and Yagiello standing next to Diana. And Stephen confesses to Jack that, well, confesses might not be the right word Stephen describes the story of yagiello descri- <laughs> and his uh, lack of understanding of democracy and the rights of way of common folk <laughs> on the way from london to portsmouth and that they'd clipped a commoner's wagon who didn't get out of the way and had to stop and had to put a new wheel on the wagon so it wasn't just lubberliness on Stephen's part it was a bit of enthusiasm on yagiello's part that had held them up as well and I love the fact that, you know, Yagiela had done such a great job as long as he had the Swedish ambassador's horses because they understood what Yagiela was saying to him. And when they had changed teams of horses, Yagiela didn't understand the horses. The horses didn't understand Yagiela. And then you had all these commoners that wouldn't get out of the way. And it was, like you said, it was a complete wreck then. We get this nice reflection as Stephen looks back at Diana through the telescope. Now, this, now Stephen gets a bit of distant perspective on Diana. And it says, all the years he had known her, she had struggled against unkind circumstances. No, no means, poverty, dependence, violent lovers. And he'd never associated, it says, Stephen had never associated Diana with laughter. Beauty, dash, style, and even wit, but not laughter. And now it's changed. He realises that he'd never known her so happy as she had been in these last few months he was not coxcomb enough to suppose that their marriage had a great deal to do with the matter. It was rather her setting up house at last. And again, Mike, we've talked about how the problem for Diana has been that she hadn't really got a place in the world. There was no place where she could be and she was this kind of perpetual nomad. She adored being rich, yet even so, a visible, tangible husband was not without an effect. Even if he were not of the right race, birth, shape, religion or tastes even if he were not what her friends might have wished her at an earlier time so i think o'brien occupying stephen's skin as he quite likes to there is playing down the charm of stephen as a husband but actually for all of that diana's really happy and settled and then just to press on for a second mike we get jack similarly looking at sophie holding up his kids holding up her son who's waving at jack And behind the eyepiece of his telescope, it says Jack smiled tenderly, an expression rarely seen by his shipmates. Mm -hmm. So I think we're balancing out, you know, earlier on, we were talking about married life being a battlefield. But for both of these men, their parting glance back at their spouses is about laughter and smiling and tenderness and happiness. And, And Stephen even, you know, he notices Jack and this children And he thinks to himself that having a child might, in his words, settle Diana's happiness. So another, you know, we keep getting these little references here. So they're they're leaving, they're seeing their families together, and they're off to Plymouth to complete their outfitting, that they've been getting the ship ready there, but they really still had more to do. Jack's spending some time thinking about how in the world he's going to set up his sails to deal with with the Mediterranean, because he knows that this ship has been created for the Atlantic and the Mediterranean is very different, especially in storms. And O'Brien, another little insight into Jack's mind, tells us that part of this, you know, excessive busyness with the sails is to deaden the pain of parting so much stronger than he, Jack, had expected. And that Jack found that the sadness persisted. So, Kind of a nice note here too. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily redemption, but it, yeah. it kind of warmed me to Jack a little bit here in the midst of this. That's right. And I think the next thing that's going to warm and redeem Jack is is the company uh, and the interaction of his fellow officers in the ship's company. So O'Brien gives us what we need in these situations, which is a dinner. Stephen heads down to the wardroom, finds that it's sparsely occupied. Stephen gets to know the rest of the wardroom members such as they are. He learns that 
so far we only have a skeleton crew aboard. There's at least, I think, um, lieutenants and a midshipman or two, and as well as a bunch of members of the ship's company to pick up in Plymouth. We have Mr. Adams, the purser, who'd been at the ball in Halifax. We get Mr. Gill, the master, who had been patched up by Stephen when Gill was a master's mate in the Hannibal. And we get a Marine officer who's a cousin to James MacDonald, who was a Marine officer that we knew uh, from a former life. And by these means, Stephen's already a little bit known to the ship's company. And uh, we get the usual praise of Stephen's skill as a surgeon. The lieutenant said they knew Stephen as a raiser of the dead and the invariable companion of one of the most successful frigate captains in the service. Ah, okay. So we get the the quick tour around the crew, but uh, I'm really glad actually that our attention goes back to Pullings because I've missed Pullings. It's been fun to meet Yagiello, but I've missed Pullings. And the steward brings in a golden goose and truffle pie. And not only the pie from Pullings, there's a song from Moat. Welcome aboard, dear doctor. Welcome aboard. Ah, so we're happy. We're eating and drinking. There's goose and there are truffles and we're singing a song. The only thing that's a little bit unsatisfactory, Mike, is is the booze. Right. <laughs> Everybody's joining in Moet's song, welcoming Stephen. You know, Pullings has talked about how he picked these mushrooms himself for, you know, to put this dish together. And and with all that great stuff, as you said, there's this thin, harsh, purple liquid that passed for claret in the Worcester's wardroom. Thin though it was, the claret was nothing like so disagreeable as a substance called port that ended the meal and and this port had kind of a unique composition (laughs) yeah the port it says had this probably the same basis of vigor and cochineal um, but the gosport wine merchant had added it says molasses raw spirit a little sugar of lead and a false date and a flaming lie by way of a label which is a really good line i'm going to have to use that about dodgy booze when i'm at dinner parties a false date and a flaming lie by way of a label Right. Oh, right. You know, now, Kyle, you, you know, you're familiar with this, Ian, but I was not. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm familiar with red dye number two, but mm. I you know it's a scarlet dye made of crushed South American insects. I think you said beetles yeah. and it's used as food coloring. And I kept thinking, you know, South American beetles, how appropriate for, you know, even though it's a bad liquor, it's a great drink for Stephen here. Right. Yeah. yeah. And for those of you who are worried at home, you can try cochineal. It's non-toxic. We've looked it up. It, well, it's, <laughs> it's pretty pretty bad news if you're a beetle, but for human beings, cochineal is fine. I can certainly remember using cochineal as a food dye cooking with my mum in the kitchen when I was little, but that's a long time ago. And yet again, we hear more of the exposition and more of the scene setting without Jack because Tom right. and Stephen go for a drink after dinner and Stephen talks about the low ceilings, the damp, confined, awkward and comfortless atmosphere of the ship, the mould. And Stephen, who's able to talk about these things quite freely and artlessly because he's a bit of a lubber, recalls frigates being more comfortable in this ship of the line. And even Pullings isn't that willing to jump to the Worcester's defence. He says she's more what we call a floating coffin than a ship. And he points out all of these shortcuts that the shipyard took in making her the very corrupt shipyard. She's overmastered. Uh, when it comes on to blow, he says her timbers will sprawl abroad. But the next thing that's happening is that they're going to get the rest of their crew in Plymouth. They're going to get not just a chaplain, but a whole bunch of chaplains to carry out because Admiral Thornton, the commander in the Mediterranean, is what they call a blue light admiral. Pullings also expresses the hope that they're going to get some good midshipmen and he's hoping for real seamen, not kids. He says, we're not a floating nursery. They'll need midshipmen to teach the the raw hands their duty. They're expecting to encounter privateers, American and French warships. And of course, the French fleet could come out any time there's a blow and the English are blown off from blockading Toulon. So these are all reasons why Pulling, I think, has high hopes of the voyage. But I think he already has pretty low expectations of how the Worcester herself is going to perform. But never mind, he says. Maybe they can handle anything, even the French fleet, despite being an unweatherly slab-sided old ship. And as Pullings is in his drink, he celebrates the idea that maybe the French will come out a fleet action. Jack is made a lord and Tom Pullings a commander at last. Oh, wouldn't we love that? That would be wonderful. With all my heart. (laughs) Yes. Well, there, Pullings is is thinking ahead about what might be and Killick comes walking in. Stephen has 
Killick sit down and have a drink with him. Actually, hands him one. He tosses it off. Thank you, sir, says Killick. Yep. And uh, then changes to his official voice. Uh, <laughs> O'Brien says he changes into his official voice without changing his uncouth, easy posture and goes on. Captain's compliments and whenever Dr. M has the leisure and the inclination for a little music would welcome his company in the cabin, which he is a tuning of his old fiddle this minute, sir. So a promising ending to chapter one. Oh, huh? promising. And another sign, Mike, that the Jack and Stephen axis is about to be restored. Yes. And with a little music thrown in. So we've got the we've got toasted cheese, we've got the prospect of music, but meanwhile, we've got potential new crew members freshly washed centerboard. And Mike, the, the, this is a little bit of documentary history for us. We haven't had very much actually in the last couple of books of O'Brien giving us the benefit of his scholarship of showing the the workings of the Napoleonic Navy. Right. But I think he really enjoys describing this moment of processing the new draft, the new hands that have been pressed and brought aboard the ship. And I think he's trying to paint the picture of the varied background and sometimes the tragic circumstances of the people who've been pressed and of the attitude of the rest of the ship's crew as well, because it's Pullings and the Clark and the surgeon and the purser, the boatswain and all the other officers who get to look at this roster of new crew members and rate them and berth them. Right, and decide who who they want and who they don't want. Yeah. Who you know who's going to be acceptable and who's you know sent back. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are old hands, and uh, we're glad to have them. But some of them have come from all kinds of strange walks of life. Yeah, we've got one, and it's fascinating how Brian tells this story, and it kind of sets us up nicely into you know insight into Stephen's character and a little of the tension here. That it's a prosperous gardener. He's seized by the press gang. And he pleads that his wife is pregnant. She won't be able to run the business without him. Uh, he admits that he had gone to sea as a boy, but he hated it. He was sick the entire time, and he stayed as far inland as ever possible. He did have to cross this bridge, which goes over water. And if you're, you know, uh, associated with water, you're you're subject to the press. Mm-hmm. You know, he was going to see a, a very good client of his, but he never does that otherwise. Well, Pullings is like, yep, too bad. That's the way it is. He's not unduly harsh to him, but it's just kind of like, that's the way the the law works. And so we've got to move on. He turns him over to Stephen for an exam. And the scene, Stephen checks him over, asks him if he lifts heavy weights in his business. And he says, no, no. And Stephen (laughs) cuts him right off, says, don't contradict me. You know, he doesn't mean, he clearly lifts heavy weights, as Stephen can tell by his forming hernia which, of course, would render him not fit for service. So Stephen gives him a stern lecture about him returning home, not using tobacco, getting bled a couple times a year, and nod, nod, wink, wink. Stephen, in his compassion, has sent this guy back home to his pregnant wife and his business here. Oh, yeah, we like this bit of compassion. And th- there's a little bit of the possibility for some for some mercy and some empathy in this really very harsh, very potentially yes. miserable situation that these press men are faced with. And maybe, maybe that's in our minds as Stephen and Jack sit together and they're both, they both get to be pleased. I think Stephen's pleased for having managed to bear this particular character from being pressed aboard the Worcester. And Jack's pretty pleased as well. He's got a good ship's company. Um, Stephen says he's surprised thinking about just the one small ship that they might take lots of men from. This is the uh, the skate, I think. And, and Jack says that they've just returned from a four-year voyage. They've been under a good captain. They should all be able seamen. He'd be happy to snap them up. But Stephen, especially the Stephen who's just been busy um, organizing the freedom of one poor pressed individual, points out that they might not be so happy, these skates, to be snapped up after four years afloat and no chance to go ashore and see their families and see their friends. That's right. It, it You know, that's... Really sounds pretty grueling. Four years gone, you're finally back, and before you even get to set foot on shore, you're snapped up by another ship here. Yeah. But Jack's like, war's a war's a tough business, right? And he's thrilled though. He's thrilled because you know what do we know that Jack loves best on ships? He loves gunnery, and Jack has. He also <laughs> Jack's uh, it, second, perhaps only to his own mirth loves getting a good deal on land but we know that when jack gets a good deal on land he's 
really getting a good deal. <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah, let me not make that reference. But, you know, so he's reporting to Stephen that he's not only pleased about his crew, he's pleased because he's bought this huge load of gunpowder from a lately deceased fireworks maker that this clerk had uh, kind of given him a tip. The clerk wants to marry the widow and he let Jack know that he could probably buy this at this distress sale here. Uh, So, you know, Jack making a quote unquote great deal on land, what could possibly go wrong? But Jack, it's not all a bed of roses, as we said earlier for Jack, because he knows that not only is he going to have to take one parson on this trip because he's sailing under uh, Admiral Thornton, but he has to actually carry a whole parcel of parsons, as he says, out to the fleet. And he's also not happy because you know he doesn't have any lieutenants. He's got Tom Pullings, who is like putting all the, he's got all the strain on him because he's got to do everything to get the ship ready. And uh, Stephen agrees. He says that Pooling's not himself and, and that Pooling's was very upset for, with Stephen for turning away a small number of men. And and Stephen says that he'll dose him strongly tonight and return him to the amiable Pooling's <laughs> that they both know and love there. Right? So things are going to be okay. We have Pooling's. Pooling's is going to get some help. Um, we also know that Jack and Stephen are in the cabin and that they can have uh, toasted cheese. Um, we also get them having an argument about philosophy, about authority and tyranny. And this is their old kind of conversational stamping ground. Jack, I think, starts it off by asking Stephen how he likes his two surgeons mates. And Stephen says he's happy enough, but that he'd rather work alone. He says, I have nothing against men these men in particular, but I'm against the whole idea of subordination. He argues that each man tends to use authority when he has it, thus destroying his natural relationship with his fellows, a disastrous state of affairs for both sides. And Mike, that gets us a Jack Aubrey speech that I think is a little bit of a Russell Crowe alert. I think a little bit of a callback to the movie Master and Commander. That's the excuse of every tyrant in history. From Nero to Bonaparte. And I, for one, am opposed to authority. Your opposition is is not my concern. Misery and oppression. You've come to the wrong shop for anarchy, brother. Earlier in their friendship, I think that might have been the cause of a bit of huffing and a bit of... (laughs) Right, uh, right. uh, But actually, this is just the ebb and flow. This is just them setting out their positions and saying, this is you and this is me. You do you and I'll do me. Yeah, they're they're certainly not, uh, you know, not upset with each other at all. I think this is kind of that uh, that, as you say, the the ebb and flow, the natural order of how we interact with each other. It's like watching a couple in love in, in Manhattan. It so is. It so is. And we also get these slightly kind of petty grievances of Jack's coming out. He's not very happy to be sailing with a ship full of Parsons. Um, Stephen, he's wondering why, why are you so upset? Are you superstitious? And Jack says. He's concerned for the sake of the hands. And he also says, you can't talk bawdy with Parsons. It ain't fitting. Well, <laughs> I've got to say, I've known a few Parsons who could tell a dirty joke, but I, I think I take the general point. That's right. Uh, the ones I knew were all whiskey pallions. Yeah. I mean, uh, piss pallions, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anglicans, I should say, yeah. right? But then we get to a crucial, I think, Ian, turning point of this book, one that raises a question that I think all of our listeners probably may be enlightened by. We discover a connection to Bach. Jack asks Stephen, did you ever meet Bach? Which Bach, says Stephen? London Bach. Not I. Now, London Bach was actually C.P.E. Bach, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, the son of one of the sons of Johann Sebastian Bach, who is the Bach that most of us these days know well. And Mike, we're getting a little musical depth here because most of the stylings and musical genres that Jack and Stephen have enjoyed so far have been firmly in what you would call you know, recent contemporary style for Jack and Stephen. Late 18th, very, very early 19th century, gallant, late classical chamber music. And... We're getting this idea, and I think it's completely fictitious, but it's interestingly plausible that they've started to discover Johann Sebastian Bach. C.P.E. Bach was for sure famous at the time of the novels. Johann Sebastian Bach didn't really become part of everybody's kind of classical music canon until after uh, composers like Mendelssohn and Brahms had made him popular in the uh, middle and later 19th century. Well, 
So we're invited to speculate that Stephen and Jack have discovered some manuscripts of Johann Sebastian Bach. I, I love this because I'm, I'm, I'm a big Bach fan. As far as I'm concerned, if it's Baroque, don't fix it. But, oh, oh, very good. <laughs> but I, it, it, in that same vein, Jack turns to Stephen and says, but the whole point is this. Bach had a father. Stephen says, heavens, Jack, what things you tell me. Yet upon recollection, I seem to have known other men in much the same case. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> and of course, the, the witticism sort of bounces Just, off of Jack at this point. Because right. he's, he's really honest. This, this father, this old Bach, who I'm, we're saying is J.S. Bach, this old Bach, you understand me, had written piles of piles of musical scores in the pantry. A whimsical place to compose in, perhaps, says Stephen, but then birds sing in trees, do they not? Anyway, Jack's having none of these musings of Stevens. I mean, the piles are in the pantry. Mice and black beetles and cookmaids played old Harry with some of the cantatas. A vast great passion, according to Mark, in high Dutch and lower down as well. He mentions a cello suite, a fiddle suite, sometimes together, um, crabbed and knotted together, not at all in the modern taste. I tried this partita in C a good many times, and the argument goes so close and deep that I scarcely follow it. Now, Mike, I, I, I'm going to take these to bits and see which of these point to which bits of real J.S. Bach, because I think it, it, most of these stand up pretty well, but not all. First of all, we've got the cantatas. Um, for sure, J.S. Bach wrote dozens of cantatas, beautiful, wonderful writing, mostly for voices, organ and orchestra. Um, we can tweet out a, a couple of examples of J.S. Bach cantatas. Great starting place. If you like vocal music, listen to the J.S. Bach cantatas. They were also the foundation for how most people learned musical harmony if like me you learned how to write four-part harmony in music classes you know in high school then you learned four-part harmony the way it was exemplified in the Bach cantatas and if, if you grew up Lutheran like me you know this really well <laughs> oh yes Lutheran liturgy and therefore probably not that accessible um, in terms of resources or in terms of style to Stephen or Jack the, no. the reference to the St. Mark passion is really fascinating by the way he's when he says high Dutch he means German <laughs> Passion, um, Bach wrote all four gospel passions, all in German. The St. John and St. Matthew passions are very, very famous now and well-known. The St. Mark passion was believed to have been lost and has been reconstructed. So I find it a bit of a stretch that they might have actually come across a copy of the St. Mark passion, but who knows? A partita in C major, yes, for sure, there was a C major violin partita. We'll play out for you a little clip of that. It's lovely, the Bach partitas, I think we're going to come back to later on as well, but they're landmark pieces for solo violin. Cello suite, of course, this is my home territory. Love the Bach cello suites. There were six of them. I've got to say, in the late 18th, early 19th century, I think they were still, to the classical music world, pretty much lost. They were rediscovered in the late 19th century. Nice. Um, but Stephen hums along this tweedly, tweedly rhythm. And I think that suggests that we might be hearing Stephen humming along to the jig from the E-flat major suite. Although uh, O'Brien is showing away here. He has Stephen wondering how he's ever going to bow it, which is a very fair question because it's not easy. And he says, well, what about the double stopping? Oh, okay, that means it's not the E-flat major jig because that hasn't got any double stopping. Here's a little bit of what he means by double stopping from the D major suite, which is absolutely fiendish. So we're scoring, I think, pretty well on cantatas. We're scoring pretty well on C major partita. We're scoring pretty well on cello suites. Mike... He, he blots his copybook a little bit with a D minor double sonata. I'm sorry, the, I'm pretty sure there's no such thing. 
if any of you listeners know otherwise, please tell us. I'm pretty sure there's no such thing as a D minor double sonata by Bach. I think O'Brien's mangling a reference to the very, very famous and beautiful double concerto, that's to say concerto for two violins in D minor. I have found a recording of what is described as a duo for cello and violin by J.S. Bach in A minor. And it's beautiful, but I think it's a, it's a transcription of something else. It's not originally a Bach duo, but we'll play a bit of that as well. This is a really great moment for Stephen and Jack. They're exploring new territory together. It gets us the chance to learn once again that they care deeply about music, that music's an emotional high point, an emotional touch point for both of their characters. We get reminded that they're both of them imperfect, that they're carrying some um, some imperfect technique and, in Stephen's case, an old injury at the hands of the French. But it really wraps up this opening kind of act of the book in a nice way for me. For all, Jack is still um, a, a little bit out of place. And for all, Stephen is flying high with his marriage and the prospect of interesting espionage activities off Toulon. It's really great that they found some music and they're back together playing. They are. And they they they, they kind of, as, they, as Jack invites Stephen to play this thing, this thing that they end up because they can't play it so well, they actually say they have to hoot some of the notes <laughs> in, in the midst of it, you know, they have a very mangled reference to Shakespeare's Macbeth at the end about knitting up the raveled sleeve of care with sore labor's bath. And Stephen saying, a better way of dealing with a sleeve cannot be imagined. Amen. But it's this idea about how sleep puts each day to rest and you know the weary labor heals their hurting minds. It's the main course in life's feast and the most nourishing. And I think, you know, on that note, Ian, a little restful sleep, a little putting our minds at ease, a little Stephen and Jack with music in the main cabin. I, I think maybe we we bid the Ionian mission goodbye for the day. What do you think? And what would you say to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien next week? I think when the sun rises again next week, I should like that of all things. <laughs> with all my heart. <laughs> Protractor, I'm trying to remember, and that he's got, he's kind of fishing. Oh, surgical retractor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right. So Jack bidding a feisty farewell. Bidding a feisty farewell. <laughs> Jack 